Hello, hello. It is so good to see you guys today. Thank you for joining me. I am here today with Donna Barwald, and she's the author of the book, This Mess is Causing Me Stress. I know. I felt that way just about every day of my life. <laughs> and here we are today, going to have a real conversation. Now she's a professional organizer, and I know many of us want to clean our homes but we can't clean until our homes are organized and we can actually get to the places that we clean, right? So today we're gonna have a really fun conversation and I'm so excited. I want you guys to jump in in the sidebar. Please ask your questions today. We're here to answer your questions. We're here to learn as much as we possibly can. And then I want you guys to run over and get a copy of Donna's book because if you are in the process of organizing your life, this is gonna be a really, really fun conversation today. So please help me welcome Donna Barwald. Hey, Donna. Hi, thanks very much for having me. This well, is thanks great. For, thanks for joining us. I appreciate this. All right. So tell me, you just did not arrive at an organized place. There's, there happened something in your life where you were like, ah, I got to do this. Tell me, tell me more. How did you get started? Who are you? How, how did this all work? Okay. Um, I grew up in San Jose in a family that I had a twin sister, a younger sister. Um, and a cousin eventually came to live with us. My great grandmother came to live with us. We were in a 1500 square foot house. So I was uh, always in a state where I had no control over what was going on. And I felt like I needed to take control and do something that was going to give me peace, right? So I would um, organize. And unfortunately, I would organize. Uh, without telling people what I was doing. So my family would get up in the, you know, in the morning and all of a sudden the kitchen is rearranged and what's going on and where do I find everything? Um, but I found that if things were in the right place, according to me, or and could fit and we could um, see what everything that we needed and do everything that we needed to do, then it would be so much less stressful. Um, I wouldn't be so aggravated because I ended up aggravated a lot. And I shared a room with my sister and she um, used to get paralyzed when it was time to clean the uh, bedroom. And we had to clean our room every day uh, and every Saturday until so that we could go out. We couldn't not, uh, we couldn't go out until our room was clean. And she would be paralyzed and couldn't do it and I'm, I want to get out of here. So I would take over and I kind of um, just could see where things would go, where things should go, what was too much, like on the dresser, too crowded. Um, and it just made me feel better in the room. I noticed changed. There's air. There's room to breathe. I mean, literally, it's a room to breathe. And I felt that that uh, is what I needed to bring peace of mind and cause me less anxiety. So I just did it all my life. Um, wherever I was, there I did it. And um, eventually I would do friends and family. And I just sometimes without asking, which don't do that. <laughs> I've learned my, well, they've learned that my was one of my questions because like my mother comes to visit, right? And she will reorganize my house, which is fine. I just can't find anything because my natural organization place is not hers. And so I have to call her 2,500 miles across the country mm -hmm. after she's gone home and say, hey, mom, where did you put my kitchen spatula or something? She'll say, oh, it's in the third drawer over from the microwave or whatever. <laughs> and she knows exactly where it is. And I have no idea. I'm like, where did she put my stuff? So was was that the same kind of thing where it was it was organic to you? But did other people then have to learn your way of doing it? or No, the biggest problem is because I don't do it by myself except for my sister. I'll okay. go to my sister's house and do what needs to be done because I know she'll appreciate it after she gets done being mad at me for just taking over. But for my clients um, and my friends or whatever, I would do it with them. And that's part of why people don't organize is that it's a lonely business and maybe they can't carry things or they don't know what to do or you know they'd rather be, you know, talking to a friend or going out or whatever. So when they have a friend come over and as an organizer, I feel like I'm a friend coming over um, to do what needs to be done and I can take the lead, but I don't work without you. Like I know house cleaners can just do what they have to do and um, and they come every week or 
every other week and they take care of your house and that's it. But I'm not like a fairy godmother. I don't come in wave a wand and, um, and automatically do things. Now, if people don't remember where we put something, because a lot of times you remember thinking about where to put it and you forget what you decided. So then they'll call me and they say, do you remember where we put, and then I have to remember, you know, but with a lot of clients, I can't remember. And sometimes I think I have stuff in my house that was really in somebody else's house, but I remember putting it away. So I can't tell, is it in my house or theirs? And I have to think, well, look in the, you know, wherever it is. And, um, and maybe we put it there. I think people should probably catalog, um, write a list of, of what's where um, after we're finished, but people don't usually keep me around, you know, to do the other stuff because, you know, it costs money. So, right. so um, you know, I do quick and easy labels. I don't think people want me to sit there and make labels on a label maker. Um, I just use a Sharpie on, on blue masking tape. And um, I'm and the same way. I'm, I'm a practical person. And so I think part of my secret to success is finding something that's functional, not necessarily something that's Pinterest worthy. And I've right. given and myself. I keep, I keep telling people that I say, um, you know, form follows function and pretty comes later. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's like a heading in one, in one of my chapters. Um, form follows function and pretty comes later. I'm more concerned with the size and um, location of storage containers and things like that. And then if you want to go to Target and buy pretty baskets or whatever it is, but if a shoebox works, we'll use a sh whatever we have, whatever we uh -huh. need to get the job done. And then, you know, you can do, you know, all the other stuff later. Right. You, if you wait until things are Pinterest worthy, then you, um, then you won't get done. And that's perfect. My big that's thing perfect. is finishing it. Let's finish the job, follow through. Otherwise you have half rooms uh, and the clutter piles up again because the room doesn't look like it's a finished room anyway. So you might as well uh -huh. shove whatever it is that you're um, <laughs> that that you need to hide at the moment that somebody's coming over. You just shove it in a back room because the back room looks like that anyway. And my idea is no, let's get it to a completed state. Get the clutter that you've decluttered out of the house. Um, get it to the donation. Um, list it on. Facebook marketplace, do whatever you're going to do and finish the job. And, and so I tell people, you know, you have to leave. I tell people leave the last 20% of the time that you have, say you're doing a five hour organizing session, which you don't have to do. And you shouldn't ever do more than five hours. Um, it's counterproductive and you won't be able, you'll be so tired and, and sore. You won't be able to get up tomorrow and, and do anything else. But I tell you, if you're going to do a five hour session, the last hour is doing all the follow through so that oh. you have time and you don't just like run out and say, oh, I got to go pick up the kid and everything stays where it is. And people start stepping over it and, you know, dumping their papers there and doing whatever. And it just never gets done. I love that because if you're thinking in terms of the process taking five hours, like we have five hours today on the Saturday to do this project and you batch it out in terms of the first hour, we're going to sort through stuff. The second hour, we're going to split it up into piles. The third hour, we're going to go ahead and pack the car and take it to the, the whatever, and then figure it out. So that the fourth, fifth hour, whatever is, is so it's finalized so that we're done with this project and there aren't piles people can trip on. I love that so much yeah. for the fact that you can then kind of pace yourself through the, oh no, I'm running out of time for this hour and I need to be onto the next section of the project. We do this a lot in house cleaning where there comes a time in every job, whether it's an organizing job or a cleaning job, where we have to, we call it pulling the ripcord. And imagine you jump out of an airplane and yeah. you're in free fall. There comes a moment somewhere in there where you have to pull the ripcord and let that parachute out. Otherwise you go smack on the ground, right? And then right. no projects will ever get done. And so we call it pulling the ripcord. It's that moment where you're like, ah, I'm not done yet. And yet I am. And so well, I, I'm sorry but, to interrupt, No, but, go ahead. but most people bite off more than they can chew. Like they mm -hmm. think, okay, I am um, going to organize the kitchen. And then they've seen a show. Um, they've seen your clutter corner. They imagine that they have, you know, their counter as their, um, as their working space. And they pull every single thing out of every single cabinet. And then it's sitting there and it's overwhelming. You know, mine, it, 
my idea is do it one at a time. You know, I'm going to take care of this shelf. This is where I should have the water bottles. Okay. I'm going to take care of the water bottles and I do everything that has to be done to declutter and organize the water bottle shelf. Now I can go, if I have time, go on to the next shelf or the next cabinet or whatever it is. So if I don't bite off more than I can chew and I keep it within a, um, a limited time, keeping in mind that we're going to need 20% of the time that we have to do all the follow through, then you know what you do and you don't have to wait for a five hour chunk of time. A lot of times people wait for, you know, the moment when they're going to have so much time to just sit there and devote to it. Well, that's good for garages because otherwise you can't really get through a garage, but the rest of your house, you can do whatever time you have, you can be doing something. I mean, organizing becomes a healthy habit and you do a little every day or three times a week. You can schedule it in. You can do it while you're waiting for your coffee to brew or something's in the microwave. You know, you go to the silverware drawer and you organize it. You see what doesn't belong there and you take it out and you decide, oh, you know, I have three measuring cup sets. What do I need that for? And you pick the best one and the other two go to um, the get rid of pile. I call it the get rid of pile because a lot of people separate things into sell and donate. My mm -hmm. philosophy is um, if you're going to go through what you're going to go through to sell, then you might still have to donate. So <laughs> it's to me, don't worry about, am I going to sell? Am I going to donate? That takes time. I don't want you to have, you know, any kind of indecision about what's going to go. I want something to go in the, I'm getting rid of it pile. I'm, it's out of my house. And the next decision I have to make after I've made the organizing decisions of like where things are going to go in the house um, or where these things, specific things are going to go is now I can look at the pile of get rid of and then make that decision, sell, donate, try to sell and donate after a month or a week or whatever it is. Um, you know, that's if you, you have to do it in manageable chunks and you can't ever wait for a huge chunk of time because it just never happens. Well, I'm so glad you brought that up. And I, I want to say hi to uh, the folks that we have that are just joining us. Thank you so much. Linda, uh, Love Shine, Babelicious, Priscilla. I'm so glad to see you guys here. Priscilla says, I'm cleaning in real time. I needed this. I love it when you guys clean along okay. with us. This is so amazing. Fran is joining us from Arizona. You guys, thank you so much for joining us today. For those of you that are, have just jumped on the call, we're here with Donna Barwald. She's the author of the book, This Mess is Causing Me Stress. This mess is making me stress. Is making me stress. I'm sorry. <laughs> and this is a really timely topic since many of us are taking a look at the next steps in our organization at home. So Donna, I'm curious, what provoked the book? Ah, well, I turned 60 <laughs> and I thought, okay, I'm not going to be physically organizing for, you know, the rest of my life. And, um, and I thought, oh, you know what? I should have done this during the pandemic when I couldn't go into anybody's houses. That would have been a smart thing, but no. Okay, I'll just, I'll do it now. But I wanted to get everything that I know down. So, well, number one, so I feel like I've accomplished uh, something and I can pass on the knowledge, even if I'm not physically there with you, the way I write, it's like I'm standing right next to you and you can hear my voice. Um, I've got funny expressions. And um, I really wanted to make my voice heard because there's a lot of things that people say and know and do that I don't think are necessarily practical. You know, I mean, people watch Marie Kondo and, you know, they, she pulls everything out of the closet and stuffs it on the bed. And it's so overwhelming. And I don't know how anybody can get through that. And are I'm you like, one of those people where you're like, I can't, I can't pull everything out and make a big pile? Yeah, because visual clutter causes stress. And if you do it in little chunks, then it's going to be, you know, much better. Plus, you need to know what you're looking for before you pull everything out. And what uh -huh. if you get called away? I'm practical. I've got a kid. In fact, I've got an autistic kid. If my kid um, decides at some point that they need me and I get pulled away and then I get tired because whatever they needed me for is exhausting, 
then I've got this big pile on my bed and now the moment's over and I don't want to do that. So, um, but the other thing is people are on this decluttering kick. That's the new word, declutter, declutter. Okay. Yes, it's important, but there's more. I mean, there's organizing comes after decluttering and then cleaning comes after organizing. And you need all three and people are like focused on what to get rid of. I have too much stuff. I have too much stuff. My big thing is you don't have too much stuff. You have the wrong stuff and it's hurting your mental health. Mm. The wrong stuff are things like duplicates because you can't find the first one. So you go out and buy the second one and then you've got triplicates because now you can't find the first two. So it's um, or things like it really what I mean, the biggest thing is, is things that don't feel good. You know, people talk about being attached to things, you know, sentimental things, they have good feelings, and they don't want to get rid of things. But people keep things that give them bad feelings. And then they feel bad about themselves. And so that's the kind of stuff that's the wrong stuff. And no matter how much stuff you have, if you have space, and if it's the right stuff, then quantity isn't an issue because you can organize, you know, if you have the space and the organization for things, you can have a lot of stuff like in a craft room. You can have every color fabric you want. That's not too much stuff. You could have, um, you know, a cricket and all these other uh, tools and all that kind of stuff. I don't, you don't need to declutter that necessarily unless it's bringing you grief. Like if you bought this expensive piece of equipment and you feel bad because you shouldn't have spent the money and I'm not mm. using it. And it and it makes me feel bad every single time I look at it. That's the kind of stuff you need gone. A lot mm. of times I, I've had clients who keep their divorce papers. Okay, you need like the certificate of divorce or whatever it's called, you know, to show people with a name change or something like that. But all the back and forth between a spouse and all the animosity and all the, you know, um, Kid. We don't have to keep all that. <laughs> yeah. Why? You know, it's like you're not a presidential library. You right. don't have to keep every single thing to document your life. And if it's going to make you feel bad, get it out of there. Uh, and, you know, stuff that you used to do that you don't do anymore, stuff that belonged to somebody who you were close with and um, had a falling out with. You know, I just finally decluttered, decluttered, got rid of, I decluttered books because I moved into this office and mm -hmm. I took a bookshelf and I looked at all of my books and I had books that were signed, you know, dedicated um, by a person I had a falling out with. And it hurts me every single time that I think about it because it was, you know, I was very close, very involved in um, her life. And she was very involved in my life. And finally, I'm like, oh, plus my kid changed their name and doesn't mm. want to see their original name. So a book mm. signed to Joshua from the friend, which I won't say, um, it hurts me when I see it. So I'm mm -hmm. like, you know what, even though it's signed and people feel like I can't get rid of a gift, you kind of have to if it's going to cause you grief. That's the wrong stuff to have. Um, you just brought so up two really interesting points. Yeah. The first one was you don't have to hang on to stuff forever. And I think that's really important. It immediately made me think of my employees. So when I have an active employee file, because I'm a business owner, I do have to keep track of those weird little conversations because mm -hmm. if I need to fire them or let them go for some reason, I need to have all that stuff documented. And so what we've done in order to kind of maximize and not you know, keep gobs of stuff everywhere is we've moved everything to electronic files. So right. now it's nothing but a shared Google Drive where we have all of that stuff documented. And if somebody sends me a text, I can upload the text into that file. Oh, and if there's cool. a document that's a paper document, I can take a picture of it with my phone and I can upload it into that electronic file. But you just made a really important point. After the divorce, do you need to save all that stuff? After I've let the employee go, I usually hang on to it for about a year. Again, it's an electronic file. It's not going to go anywhere, but that gives me all the way till and until the time I file my next set of taxes. If for any reason I need to dip back into those archives and I need to look something up or, you know, did we pay this person on a certain day or was there a bonus that was given or whatever, whatever the, the reasons yeah. are, I have all that accessibility to that information. 
attention. But then after about a year, after we've closed out all the records and all the books and that employee is officially done with our company, then I go ahead and I remove those files and I don't need to hang on to them forever. So that was a really important point that you brought up because there's a time and a place to save stuff. And then there's a time and a place to say, hey, we're done with this. Let it go. And one of the things we've talked about here in the hoarding world and clutter corner conversations is uh, our paper documents, because I know a lot of us are now moving electronically. Mm -hmm. And that goes with our photos, that goes with our tax records, that goes with everything that we have. And so I love the fact that you're bringing up the fact we don't need to hang on to stuff longer than we need to hang on to it. So awesome. I I call paperwork paper worst. Because it really is. And people hate the papers. And that's what makes a whole lot of piles. Um, and they don't know. What do, what do I need to keep? What do I don't? In my book, I have like a whole list. This is what you need. This is what you can let go of. Or you only need the front page or whatever. I mean, you only have so much space. Like a computer, you only have so many uh terabytes or gigabytes or whatever of storage. So you have to just make decisions and know what I need, what I don't need. And if you don't know, um, the information's out there. And um, and then it becomes manageable. But, uh, but people have this indecision because they don't know. And that's another thing I tell people is if you need information to make a decision and that's what's causing the, the holdup, get being stuck, well, then find out the information. Um, But paperwork, definitely. In fact, it's the very last thing that we do. I talk about organizing as an ongoing um, habit, like exercising, okay? And so you have to start when you start working out. You know, you don't pick up a 100-pound weight um, and get overwhelmed and hurt yourself and you never go back to it again. No, you start with little tiny things. So you start with little tiny decisions that are not so consequential. And you work your way up to the more important decisions and then, um, and the harder decisions. And now that you've built up your decision-making muscles, by the time we get to the paper worst, (laughs) then you already are in the habit and you already have established a habit of knowing, is this important? Do I need it? Does it cause me grief? Why am I keeping the rejection letter from the job I didn't get? Why am I keeping the rejection letter from the um, uh, college that I wanted to get into? What is this doing for me? Why do I need the ticket to Disneyland when my boyfriend left me there stranded after we had a big fight? You kind of don't. <laughs> mm-hmm. You really don't. And it hurts your mental health. And that kind of stuff. I remember, get rid of. I remember when I first started writing. I sent my publication off to a a publisher and I got a rejection letter and I was like really hurt. Like, ah, I can't believe this is a really good book. I can't believe I got rejected. Mm -hmm. And then I got rejected again and again and again and again and again. And I saved them all. And I was going to write a book called 101 Ways They Told Me No. (laughs) And I saved them. I saved them to motivate me to, I'm going to keep trying. Uh, This is really good information and I want to get it out there. And I got to the realization that I was like, if nobody's going to publish this, I'm going to publish it myself. I'm I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do this because I really still believe this is really good information. And one of the things that triggered it, and this goes back to why are we keeping things? Is there a reason why? And I kept those letters to motivate me to just keep trying. I'm going to keep trying because how many ways can someone say no? Well, about a hundred so far. (laughs) That's true. And that's the thing. It's like somebody would say, you have too much right? You don't have too much if that's what it's there for. And you have the file space or whatever to keep it. Or if you've digitized it and you have the computer space to keep it. Um, It's when you don't look at things. And the problem Mm -hmm. is people don't know what they have. You know, they become clutter blind, especially if you've lived in a house for a long, long time, um, or you moved um, Mm. and all you see, or you've moved and downsized and you never fully unpacked and all you see are the boxes or whatever. You have no idea what's in there. And why is it taking up space if I don't know what it is? And that is an interesting point. Yeah. Because if you have stuff you've never unpacked, do you really need it? And And so one of the (laughs) you one of the exercises we went through when we moved, we put a bunch of stuff in, you know, you label it as you go, but we put a bunch of stuff in the garage and we said if we don't open this within three months, 
we probably don't need it. And so when it came time to throw it away, we were like, do we need to open these boxes and go through? Is there anything in here that we're going to really regret? Well, we haven't used it in the last 90 days in our new home. And we added this stuff to these boxes because this was stuff we didn't really use a lot in the old home. So before we open it and then remind ourselves of all the things we thought we needed, we haven't used it at all in like 90 days. So we probably don't need it. Can we just let it go? And then that will give us more space to just organize and maintain the stuff that we have. And we did. We just let it go without rehashing it and then re getting re emotionally reattached to it right. and all those things. Because you already, made, you already looked at it and you made the decision and it was intentional. It wasn't just last minute stuff that you shoved in a box. And that's the biggest thing is that people, when they move, a lot of time, because that's my next book, actually, is this move is making me stress. Um, oh, because, that's a great one. Because when they move, chances are it's because it's another one of those stressful events. Like there's the top five stressful events. Um, losing somebody, losing your job, um, you know, uh, I can't think of what they are right now, but they all involve, or most of them involve divorce, whatever they mo all involve moving. And mm -hmm. so moving itself is one of the top five. So you add it with another stressful event and that's the last place anybody, or that's the last thing anybody wants to do. In fact, they're unable to do it. Because mm -hmm. you can't make a decision when you're stressed. Right. You're, the way your brain works, that I could explain the science. Well, I actually did. I can't tell you the details at this moment. But <laughs> <laughs> there's a science to it. And you cannot make a decision when you're stressed. Uh -huh. And so you, um, a lot of people just throw things in boxes. And, and you know what? You don't have to decide if you, but you do have to go through it at some point. And it makes more sense if you say you're just downsizing and you're moving because you want to. Um, it makes sense to downsize first before and declutter before you even pack, because mm -hmm. why are you going to pay for the move? And it costs money for the space. It costs money for the pounds. It costs money for the time it takes. So a lot of times people bring over all this stuff, oh, well, you know, and they haven't looked at it. They don't know what it is. It's been sitting in their closet forever. And um, and then it sits and takes up space in the garage or they put it in a storage unit, which makes no sense. And now um, they've paid and they keep paying and they keep paying for when they finally open up and they say, oh, this is junk. Why did I do that? I mean, plus movers, sometimes they pack up your garbage. So weird. When we moved, they just packed up the garbage can, I mean, the trash baskets without even emptying them. So if you have somebody else packing for you and you have no idea what they are. Um, so if you've already looked at it like you did and said, you know, th this is the maybe pile, because when you declutter, I definitely always have a maybe pile. Either mm -hmm. it's an instant, yes, like you're an instant, like you know, yes, I need to keep this. And there are things people say, I can't make a decision, but you really can. There are some things you know you need to keep. My birth certificate, okay? Mm -hmm. I need this. My right. phone, my phone charger. Okay, those are instant yeses. The then there's instant no's. It's broken. You can see it. It's garbage. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't um, work anymore. Or you. It shouldn't even be in the house. You know, it didn't make it all the way out to the garbage. That's an instant no. But anything you have to think more than two seconds about, I call it the two second rule. If you have to think more than two seconds, put it aside, put it in the maybe pile, and then go on because people get derailed by trying to make that decision. Right. And then they can't make the decision and time runs out and nothing gets done or they get flooded with emotion, usually uh you know, negative emotions. Uh -huh. um, and then they just stop. And it, it just, it's a never ending battle. If you think you always have to do it all, you don't have to make every decision. In fact, I talk about a whole procedure, a set of steps. And the first step is just yes or no. And if you can't make it, then it's maybe. After you've organized what you've said yes to, then if there's room, you can add sometimes the maybes. Like, I really like this um, set of champagne uh, flutes. And, you know, maybe we'll want to toast 
um, a job or a birthday or an anniversary and I'll have, you know, a dinner party and everybody needs a champagne flute. Okay. But if I don't have room in my cabinets and it's uh-huh. going to be sitting there on that off chance that maybe this will happen, then if I have room, I'll keep it. If I don't, I don't. And you won't know that until you organize. So an, an interesting point of that, and this is what we do in our household, but it's along the same lines. Um, I'll try to get rid of something and my husband will say, no, I'd like to keep that. And that would be our maybe. Do we want to get rid of it? Do we want to keep it? Maybe we're not so sure. Can we both agree that at some point we're going to get rid of this? Yes, we both agree. Okay, we don't have to get rid of it today. But as long as we both agree that we can get rid of it at some point, that lets us already know it plants the seed. We're going to get rid of this. And so then if I have the space and I put it back in the cupboard or I put it back in the closet and it's not interfering with anything, we're not tripping over it. It's not a hazard to anyone. There's plenty of space for it. It's just that we're not using it. Why do we still have this? We've both agreed we're going to throw it away, but not today. Right. And then the next time we do the cycle through again and we're doing that closet or those cupboards, we pull it out again and we say, we've both agreed in the past that we're going to throw this away. Is today the day? Mm-hmm. And it might have been that just enough distance has passed that he's like, yeah, you know, we haven't even used it since the last time we had this conversation. Let's go ahead and get rid of it. And oddly enough, we've got this set of dishes where he keeps saying, no, let's hang on to it. We don't have to throw it away today. And I mean, like we're 21 years into our marriage now and we haven't thrown that set of dishes away yet, nor have we ever used them since we've been married. So there's something about that set of dishes that he is hanging on to, but yet we've both agreed to get rid of them. So when we move again, I'm guessing that's the time that we're not going to take them to the new place because we have a lot less cupboard space in the new place. So we won't be taking them with us. But until today, I guess they can still hang out because they're in the cupboard and they're not hurting anything. And we have the space and all the things, right? (laughs) A lot of times people keep things also that they don't can't get rid of yet because it's a dream that they're not ready to let go of. Mm-hmm. So maybe your husband has this idea that you're going to have a big party and everybody needs um, more plates or, you know, he wants to have backyard barbecue and instead of using paper, he's going to use those plates or people have Christmas plates and they think, oh, we'll keep this because, you know, it'll be nice to have Christmas. And then they realize they have, you know, a set of 20 plates and that's a lot of dishes to wash. And eventually they're going to say, you know, let's just do paper. But um, I call garages the home of broken dreams because um, they're always filled with things that people think that they're going to do or used to do or Mm -hmm. had a dream about doing. And then it becomes obvious, you know, it's just not going to happen. People hold on to things for the grandkids, okay? And then guess what? They don't even have kids or their kids aren't going to have kids. And it's obvious that it's not happening or the stuff they saved, the, you know, um, it the stains come out, you know, if it's old and you, you think it's a clean thing and then you get these yellow stains or the elastic um, is worn out or whatever it is you've saved. It's like, well, now it's not going to serve that purpose. Mm-hmm. Or you find it and then you say, um, I always, I'm, I'm saying now that if you find something and you've saved it all these years, it's like, this is the moment that you saved it for. Mm-hmm. I want to show my kids my high school career. And I've got all this memorabilia from high school that now they're in high school. Now they're going to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. So you go through it with them and you've explained it and you've seen it and you've enjoyed it. And that's it. I mean, this is the moment that you saved it for. Or people And then what have, happens to that moment after? Then do you get rid of it after that moment? Yeah, you can. Or it reduce. I mean, my big thing is keep the best, reduce the rest. Okay? Mm-hmm. You don't have to. I mean, you do want to keep the best or the thing that's most meaningful. If you're going to, if you have a yearbook and it's this thick, you know, and um, And you have to decide, do I have room for this yearbook or do I want to fit everything in a smaller box? Okay, well, you could rip out the pages that you're on or that have the uh, people who signed it that you want to care about. You know, you don't have to keep the whole thing. I just heard about some people with cookbooks who love cookbooks. In fact, I have a friend who's just like a cookbook addict and she gives them for presents. And I've helped her declutter years and years ago just her cookbooks 
Um, and they took up shelves and shelves and shelves. But I just heard um, somebody else suggest that you go through the cookbooks with your family and you pick out the recipes that they think they'll actually ever eat. And you rip it out. I know it seems wasteful, but you rip it out because that's what they're there for is to use. And then you can give away, throw away, whatever, the rest of the book because it's taking up space. And a lot of times it's taking up space in your kitchen, which is valuable prime real estate. And so you're, um, it's taking up space and you want to actually um, have it for something else, but you keep the recipes. Um, so there's that. Or somebody was talking about, I'm in a lot of, of these declutter groups and I see the kinds of problems that people have and it helps and I give advice. And, um, but it helps me know like, you know, what people are, thinking about. And that's, again, you asked why I wrote a book. It's because things are they're so obvious to me because I've been living them with them. Um, these ideas for so long are like brand new to people. And it changed just like one little nugget of, of information, a tidbit of advice, like changes their whole life. And the ability to transform lives and pe make people feel better about themselves that's what I'm all about. So, but I, I see people and their problems, like somebody found Waterford crystal that they haven't used and they're 70, 80 years old or whatever. And I said, you know what? This is the moment you save this for. Get rid of all the junky classes, mismatched stuff that's in your cabinets now and use the Waterford. So one breaks. Oh, well, but you're using it. You don't have to give it away. You know, why? Well, you know, Just because you're not using it, use it. It's interesting when we got married, we did not have enough money to have a great big fancy wedding reception. And we got married a little bit later in life. So we decided that instead of having a great big fancy wedding reception, we would take the money and we would invest it into the house. And that way, if we ever sold the house, we'd get the equity back from the party. Mm -hmm. But we would just invite people over kind of like an open house. So that was going to be our big wedding reception. Well, when it came time to serve food, we thought, well, we could try to buy fancy dishes and you talk about the Waterford crystal and all these things to make it a really elaborate event or right at the County line where we go from North Carolina over to South Carolina, there was this great big pottery store where they sold all the glass dishes that you rent from the, the fancy places for a dollar a piece. Mm -hmm. So you could get each individual cup, saucers, plates, all the things that you need at a dollar a piece. So we figured out how many people we were going to invite over and we went and we bought one of each of those pieces instead of renting them. Because if we rented them, we would be renting them at a dollar a piece. But if we bought them, then we owned them. And then we could either sell them or we could give them away or we could just use them. So it made more sense to us to just buy them and then own them. And if we broke them, we don't have to replace them. We just own them and then whoopsie, right. they broke. So we went ahead and we bought these all. And this is 21 years ago. Well, to this day, every meal, every meal we've eaten has been on these glass fancy dishes that we bought. And we just put different colored chargers for different holidays underneath them. So mm -hmm. all the dishes like the fancy china and the dishes that my husband used when he was a bachelor and all these other dishes we have never even used. We just have used these um, dishes, clear glass dishes with the fancy designs in them that we bought for the, originally for our wedding. And what's really weird is we've lost a couple pieces over the years where one has dropped and broken or what, again, whoopsie, but we, we had lots of them, right? So we got a cupboard mm -hmm. full of all these dishes. And the interesting point is um, instead of us not using the fancy stuff, if you're gonna have it, use it. It doesn't make any sense to have a bunch of really nice stuff. And I know lots of people over the years, we've cleaned hundreds of people's china cabinets where they mm -hmm. have dishes and silver and all different kinds of platters and things that they use once or twice a year on the holidays, like Thanksgiving or Christmas or Mother's Day, because they don't wanna ruin it or whatever. They're saving it for a special occasion. Why not make every day a special occasion and just really enjoy the heck out of it because we only live life once. Right? right. And if we're going to have a bunch of stuff we never use, why hang on to it? And then if we have it and we, it means something to us, why not use it? Right. right. And I tell people, why, why do your guests, um, why are they deserve better things than you? You know, mm -hmm. you deserve nice things just because you don't have anybody over, um, you know, use it. And when you think about that, it's like you deserve nice things. Seriously, if you're holding on to like ratty towels, and you buy, you know, some at Costco and you like them and they're nice and you shove the 
old ones to the back or whatever. It's like, why do you have these? You deserve mm -hmm. nice towels. And so get rid of the junk, you know, keep the best, reduce the rest. If you're going to have backup, okay. But here's the thing. People always go for their favorites. Mm -hmm. You know, you have those dishes, but you have, you know, a nice attachment to the glass and to the, to the ones that you bought for the open house. And so people are always going to go for their favorites, even if you've got choices and choices and choices. Um, so my philosophy is you don't need all the backups because given the opportunity, you're going to reach for your favorite mug. You know, you like big mugs. What do you need all those little tiny promotional mugs for? You know, you think, you know, somebody's going to come over, uh, you're going to have a coffee party or, um, or you're not going to wash your glasses, your coffee mugs for ages. I mean, there's just two of you, right? So oh. it's taken up space and, it, and it's aggravating. I mean, my, another one of my famous sayings is <laughs> aggravation is motivation. If I have to be aggravated every time I go into this cabinet, cause I can't get what I want easily, then I'm going to organize, declutter, get it to a place where it's easy because I don't need aggravation in my life. I tell people, whatever aggravates you most in the morning, that's the first thing that you should be on your list for when you're going to declutter. And you should make an appointment to declutter every day. Put it in your calendar. You know, if, um, if it's just as important as anything else you do. People go to yoga, that's in their calendar, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays at, at nine, whatever it is. It's like, put it in your calendar that you're going to organize at least three times a week, just like exercising, so that you can get rid of this aggravation um, and then keep a list all the time, you know, put it in the notes in your phone, you know, uh, note to self, you know, uh, figure out this under the bathroom cabinet because it's annoying and I can't find, you know, the rolls of toilet paper I need because all this other stuff is, you know, taken away. Or I can't see all the cleaning stuff I have. I have all my cleaning supplies underneath um, uh, the, in the cabinet, underneath the sink in the bathroom. And I'm glad you if, brought that up because a lot of people don't have a time on their calendar when they're going to go underneath the bathroom sink. They really don't. It is never right. a priority. And in the 32 years I've been cleaning as a professional house cleaner, I've never found somebody that's like, oh, yes, on September 7th, I'm cleaning underneath my bathroom sink. But what Unless we do is this, because yeah. as a professional cleaner, we do offer that service. So what we do is we trigger our clients by saying in the month of September, this is when we're doing these types of chores, cleaning out the, the uh, winter closet, the coat closets for wintertime, get, getting rid of last year's coats so that we have room for this year's coats because we know you're going to find a new fancy coat that you want this year. Right. But in September, when it's really hot outside, people are so forgiving and so easy to let go of their winter coat thinking, oh man, it's 100 degrees outside. I don't want that coat, sure, take it. But in the cold of the winter, they're like, mm, I might need that the day after tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. So we disconnect them from the time at hand and we get rid of all of their summer pool stuff and their pool noodles and the extra mm -hmm. pool stuff that they had and the extra beach towels that they haven't used in years and all those things. We get rid of those in the winter time when it's not top of mind. Hey, let's go through that closet now where you've got all the pool stuff and the extra outdoor activity stuff. And they're like, man, it's free rigid outside. It's freezing. We don't want to talk about swimming pool stuff now. Great. Mm -hmm. Let's get rid of it. And that's been an easy way to disconnect them from the moment if, it, if we get rid of stuff off season, but we'll trigger it in advance. And we'll say this every year is when we do this. This is when we go through the attics. This is when we go through the garages. We get rid of stuff specifically knowing that it's not going to be an emotional tug like, oh, I'm going to need that tomorrow. Right. And they're like, I'll never use that again. And it's easy way out in the future to get rid of stuff. Right. So, so I, I do the organizing best when I'm bringing stuff into the house. So I have this concept called crap equilibrium. Okay. You huh. only have so much room. Okay. And so whatever you bring into the house, the crap that you bring into the house, it's taking the place or it should take the place of something that you already have because you say you're shopping, you're shopping and you go out and you see um, a beautiful tablecloth. OK, mm -hmm. so you have a tablecloth and you bring it in and you're trying to put it away and your tablecloth um, drawer is overflowing and you like this one the best. That's why you bought it. it. You like it better than whatever you have. So don't shove your thing that whatever you have to the back. Um, 
take it out. That's the time to, to give it away. And I'm thinking about under the sink in the bathroom when I buy the big things of toilet paper. And now I'm down underneath there. It's like, well, what is this stuff? You know, I'd like to be able to just get to my toilet paper. And you pull the stuff out and you're like, oh, this shouldn't be there. That shouldn't be there. A lot of times people, a lot of times clutter comes because people are coming over and mm. they're having company, which is a great motivator, but people just shove things places to hide them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have company coming over, the bathroom list needs to look nice. Whatever's on the counter gets thrown under the sink. Okay. And never thought about again, unfortunately, until you have to put a Costco sized uh, package of toilet paper under there. And then again, aggravation is motivation. And you want to go through that. So whenever you're bringing something home, whether it's because um, you bought it, or um, you inherited it, or you're getting hand me downs, you know, for the kids, whatever it is, that's the time to go through what you already have in the closet or cabinet that this new thing is going to go in or the drawer that the new thing is going to go in because it only have so much space and whatever new thing came in is going to be your favorite. So whatever you had as backup, because whatever you used to have, you had a favorite and then you had backup, the backup you can get rid of now because you're used to be your favorite is going to be backup. And now you have a favorite and that's the one you're always, always going to use. Um, that's how I, people always say, well, what, how do you pick what to declutter? It's like, well, pick your favorites because that's all you're going to use anyway. Like office supplies. Okay. I have a ton of pens. I know I have too many pens, right? People always say I have too many pens. I have too many crayons. I have too many, this, I have too many, that. Um, and I'm like, well, what's your favorite kind of pen? Now people mm -hmm. don't think about that, but you mm -hmm. have a favorite, you know, what feels mm -hmm. good in your hand. Keep those. Get rid of the others because you're always going to go for your favorite pen, even if it still works, even if the other ones still work and they're useful, but they're, you know, that's another decision. Is it useful? Is it useful to somebody? Is it useful to me? No. Okay. Is it useful to somebody? Great. Donate it. Mm -hmm. And, and if it's not useful to anybody, that's trash. These are the questions that you have to ask yourself, but you have to keep that crap equilibrium. Um, and otherwise, you're just bringing way too much in with no place to put it. And mm -hmm. then it gets stacked up and becomes the clutter pile. A lot of people's clutter, I can't believe it. So they buy these things, they spend all this money, and they don't put it away, and they don't use it, and they don't know they have it. Because again, clutter blind, you pass by it, and you forget you have it. And then they feel bad about getting rid of it because they spent all that money. Well, if you get in the habit, the healthy habit of putting away things that you bring home new and getting rid of the thing that it's replacing, then you never have to worry about, I'm not using this because it's hidden under some pile and I have to keep it now because I feel bad about spending all that money. Can we talk about that for a second? Because that's a big hang up that we get a lot where people have spent money and it's hard earned money. And they're buying things because those things either represent a dream that they have, like mm -hmm. in, in my next version of myself, I'm going to be eating breakfast out on the patio, drinking out of these really fancy mugs. So they buy the fancy mug. And mm -hmm. like you said, then they don't take the time to have the tea out on the patio and they don't use the fancy mug. So where where is that in the um, the lineup of being clutter-free and organized where you actually make the time to use the things you bought because they were going to, you, you bought them because you were buying a dream. When right. are you going to take the time to live the dream that you bought the stuff for? And I tell people also that I encourage people to dream because that's what gives you the motivation to declutter the space that needs to be decluttered. For example, maybe you don't go on your patio because it's a mess mm -hmm. and there's, you know, junk, actual junk hanging around and, um, you know, your furniture is falling apart or whatever it is. It's not comfortable out there, but you still have that dream. I really would love to go on this patio because if it was nice, I would be out there every day having my morning coffee and everything would be relaxed and great. Okay. Now you have a reason you've got the why when the why becomes stronger than the why not, that's the perfect time to declutter 
organize and actually get to live the lifestyle that you dream about. So for every room that's de that's cluttered, yeah, everybody's got some back room or whatever, that's a mess. And they just throw things in there. It doesn't matter because it's already cluttered anyway. So mm -hmm. they just get, that's, you know, the throw in their pile when you don't want, maybe, you, you know, maybe you just don't feel like putting it away that moment. So it gets thrown in there. But if you dream about it and it's like, wow, I would really love to have a meditation room. And this has such bright light and it's really, it feels good to be in here when I don't have all this crap around. So then now you've got your motivation to clean because otherwise cleaning and decluttering and organizing and all of that feels like a chore. But if you've really got um, the motivation, the why, what it's going to feel like when it's done and this room becomes this, not only that, but you can get buy-in. Say you have teenagers and you need them to help you um, and or your husband or whatever. And the last thing they want to do is clean up. If you say, could you help me organize the back room? Oh, that's going to, you know, get the response that you can imagine. It's like, no. <laughs> oh, let me check. My, no. own, <laughs> my, my husband's very creative with his spare time. He wants to go write his children's books. So it's like the last thing he wants to do is organize. But if I said, hey, can you help me move the rooms around so that we can create this beautiful new office that we can write in and it becomes our writing room and it gets the morning light and it feels really good and it could also be the guest room then you can have them buy into that dream. When you uh -huh. have them buy into that dream, you've got the help. All of a sudden now it's like, great. And you've got something specific to say. Can you move this bed to this room and bring in the desk? Okay, now they know exactly what to do. It's not like they look at it overwhelmed and go, oh, you know, because you have the vision and you're sharing uh -huh. the vision. And that's really um what you do because when you buy stuff like your cups like the exercise equipment um that sits in the closet like everything you know you have this idea of who you want to be mm -hmm. and then you're just not set up to be that person but if it were set up you would be you know and so um and then you feel bad and i want to i want to stop right there for a second because if you're looking to the future at the best version of yourself and in the best version of myself we go out every morning and we sit on the patio and we have the the cup of tea in the morning what happens then if you create the space for that and you get the patio furniture ready to do that there's nothing then stopping you from becoming that person except you. And this happened to us literally this last week. We upgraded our furniture on the patio. And as we upgraded, it's old furniture that we've had, but we then sanded down any rust moments and we re, you know, restained it with the, the rust-oleum, rust-proof paint and all that stuff. And we fixed up the patio. And then lo and behold, it doesn't do anybody any good and what's all the work for unless you actually are willing to use it. So literally, I got my husband up an hour earlier than normal. And I said, hey, let's go out and have breakfast on the patio and watch the sunrise. He's wow. like, why would I do that? Because I'm sleeping in. And I said, because we just spent a lot of time and energy fixing up the patio because we wanted to do that. And uh, the newsflash, no one is coming to graduate us from getting out of bed at this time in the morning to getting up earlier and creating those moments. It is up to us to do that. We get to do that. And so if you don't get up right now, we're going to miss that window. And then later in the day, you're going to wish, oh, I, I got the patio furniture ready and I had this vision and yet I never took action on it. So there's one more step beyond just getting the place ready. And that's graduating yourself from the old you to the new you. So mm -hmm. lo and behold, day one, day two, day three, day four, I kept waking him up every day an hour early. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hey, let's go have breakfast out on the patio. And so then he would get up and we would go out and we would do that. Okay, well, what happened is today he gets up early. Nobody wakes him up. I go in there and he's already making the bed. I get up much earlier than he does, but he's already in there making the bed. I was like, whoa, look at you. You're already up for the day. He goes, yeah, because we've been going walking and then we come back and we have the breakfast out on the patio. So he says, uh, I'm really liking this new version of me. And I said, what changed? Because there was this many years where there wasn't that version of you. And he said, I never knew this version of me was possible. And I said, now that you're trying this out for a week or two, how do you like it? He said, I'm kicking myself in the pants that I didn't do this years ago. I feel like I wasted so many years 
where I could have, I could have been an early riser and I could have gotten so much done. And he's so pleased with himself. It's eight o'clock in the morning and I've done my workout for the day and I've had my breakfast and I've done my meditation and I've already resolved all these things I was going to do for the day. And I paid some bills that da, 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 it's eight o'clock in the morning and I'm like, happy bell. Yay. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and the space is there and you've yeah. created the space. So you've created the lifestyle yeah. and that's really important because if you feel stuck and you don't like what's happening and you want to be different and you can't physically move out or, you know, you watch HGTV and you see these beautiful homes get these makeovers and, you know, or they move into a brand new home and everything is clean and pristine um, or they go to a hotel and there's no clutter around and you feel different in that space. Well, then let's make that space different so that mm -hmm. you can feel that and not feel bad. People go around feeling bad about themselves all the time. And it's not healthy and it's not fun. And it um, and it makes them feel less than and there's no reason why they should. So a lot of people, they just say, oh, I'm a terrible person. My house is so cluttered. I'm a hoarder. I'm, you know, this, that, the other thing. And I'm so ashamed to have people over. And they feel all these negative feelings. And it's like, wait a second. It's just a circumstance. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you were a real hoarder with clinically, you know, with the definition and, um, you know, part of the DSM, and I go into exactly what that means. People use the term hoarder loosely and um and there's an actual real thing that's a problem but if you just have too much stuff or you got or your house is cluttered because you got hurt like i just um broke my arm and you can't see my hands right now but i, I did notice that i, I talked with my hands so my finger showed up i broke a finger i broke an arm oh and no been, stop and stop been, busting yourself up donna <laughs> and i feel for people because i've done people's houses where they just are in pain they're physically unable to do things and i'm mm -hmm. watching my house get more and more cluttered because i'm the organizer my kid and my husband you know my husband thinks he's cleaning up or organizing because he um piles things nicely you know he tetrises things so they're all nice in the looks orderly but he never gets rid of the stuff and it's like, no, we got to put it away or get it out of here or put it in the garage or whatever needs to happen. But I was sitting here for months already because um, I got hurt May 25th. And I've been sitting so here sorry. and only this week I've been able to start doing things. And so I couldn't take it. <laughs> I'm like, I have to get up because it's hurting my mental health. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. okay, maybe I'm physically healing, but mentally I'm like going crazy. So... I feel for people who do that um, because then they're stuck and then they feel bad. But if that's why your house is a mess, there's nothing wrong with you. And if your house is a mess because um, it's just a mess, maybe you're neurodivergent, you're ADHD, and you don't have those executive functioning skills because um, organizing is one of them, prioritizing and initiating and all those things are executive function skills you're not a bad person, you're neurodivergent, you know, plus you start and you get distracted and whatever. And it's not set up in order for you to succeed. And you feel terrible because you're a mess. Well, because you don't have that skill. But do you feel terrible if you can't sit down at a piano and play a concerto? Do you feel terrible if you can't pick up a paintbrush and look like, you know, Picasso or an impressionist? No, you don't feel bad about yourself because you can't do that. It's just a talent you don't have. Well, organizing is a talent maybe that you don't have, but you can get better at it, just like you can learn piano and you can learn painting and you may never be Picasso or Mozart or whatever, but you can get better about it and then you feel better about yourself. And my whole thing is when you start to organize and get your house in a way that actually feels like a space that you want to be in, then you start feeling transformed yourself. And like your husband with getting up in the morning and he's transformed. So you've transformed a space, a room, and now he's transformed because now he's in that space and the energy is different and it feels good. And yeah, you might feel regret because you didn't start sooner, but you're doing it now. You know, it's like, I feel bad that I didn't use crystal all those years, but I'm doing it now. 
and I don't have to continue to feel bad. I can feel better about myself and I'm not a bad person. And that's the thing. Oh, so this is people, so good. So many people, they feel like they're bad people and you know they're successful in every other part of their life and they can't get it together at their house. Well, I heard you on another podcast say, well, people are busy. You know, and they're busy working and they don't have time. And that's why they hire us. People are ashamed to bring people over, even a professional organizer. They're too embarrassed to have me in their house. I'm like, look, I'm not judging you. If it were easy, I wouldn't have a job. So it's not you. Speaking of a job, our time is up today, please. Oh, oh my goodness. This is so awesome. We've learned so much from you today and we're going to have to have you back. This is just phenomenal. I, I could just listen to you all day and we've, we've learned so much. I see by the comments also that we've had just an enormous amount of people following along and thanking you for your time and your expertise today. Please share with our listeners where they can go to find you. And then I will leave links to all of that in the show notes below. So those watching the replay and also everybody that joined us today can participate. Okay, well, um, neatlyarranged.org is my company. I'm based out of Los Angeles, but I do virtual um, consulting. So um, I've been doing that this summer while I'm hurt, and people are really getting a lot out of it. So that's one thing. Um, you can buy my book, and it sounds exactly like me, and you'll see things that I've talked about here and more. Um, and that's on Amazon and every other uh, online book uh, bookstore have online uh, parts to their website. So you can go to anybody and find that. Um, I have a Facebook page um, and I have a Facebook group called This Mess is Making Me Stress. I would love people to come to the Facebook group and join so that I can um, encourage people. So everybody else can encourage people and I can give advice and you can learn from each other and pick up tips and all that. So This Mess is Making Me Stress is a Facebook group, neatlyarranged.org, uh, no, dot .com, sorry, neatlyarranged.com is my website. Um, and you can go to author pages on Amazon. There's author pages on, um, on Facebook too, but I haven't done anything much on that. And my daughter, my 21-year-old college graduate, is about to um, hook up all the social media stuff because, you know, I'm of that age where I didn't grow up with it and it's a lot of work and um, I'm, We're the twins. <laughs> I'm the organizer. She's the social media queen. So I she's about to do all that do, stuff either. Yeah. She's oh. about to do all of that. Um, so I'll be um, active because I have an Instagram account, but I'll be active on Instagram um, and uh, TikTok and all. I'm going to start making reels. So just talking awesome. like this to people, awesome. giving little bits every day to encourage you and to make you feel better about yourself and to give you real good practical advice from a Jewish mother um, who is a recovering perfectionist um, who knows and has lived um, this life. And it's a, like I said, it's a healthy habit. That's all it is. Nobody um, comes to it naturally, I don't think. Um, they've just either had it as a kid as a habit and brought it up with them or they're newly making it. So just like working out, you got to make it a habit at least three times a day, schedule it. And, um, and you can also uh, get the ebook. Also, if you're not a reader, if reading is distracting, or you don't want my book cluttering your house, you can go get the ebook on Amazon and read it there. And also Barnes and Nobles, uh, Nook, whatever, they all have it. So awesome. Um, Thank you so pleasure. much for joining us today. And thank I want to thank so everybody here for, uh, for chiming in and for also participating with us. This show doesn't mean anything unless you guys show up, and unless we get your comments and unless we get your feedback. So I really want to thank you for going along on this ride with us. And thank you again, Donna, for joining us. This was so insightful and very helpful.